Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Live Through Jesus podcast with Courtney Gilmore. On this episode, trust, patience, obedience, and self-control. I know, hard words, not something you think you want to hear at the first of the year, but it will be encouraging, so stick with me. This is Joshua 8, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version and the ESV Version. Quickly before we get started, if you're new to Live Through Jesus, make sure you go to livethroughjesus.com and sign up to receive your free five-week Bible study over Abraham. There you'll also find blog posts that coincide with the teachings on this podcast and social media links, which is another way to keep in touch throughout the week. Okay, let's get started. So welcome back after the holidays. I hope that you had a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. It's been a long time since we met, but just as a reminder, we're in the book of Joshua. Moses has died. Joshua is bringing the people into the promised land. And during their very first battle in Jericho, God told them, I will bring you victory, but you need to do things the way I tell you to. And they did defeat the people there. But God forbid them from taking any of the plunder. He said, every single thing in this city is devoted to me. Some of the things will go into my treasury and the rest of the things I will devote to destruction. And if you take any of these things that have been devoted to my treasury or that have been devoted to destruction, then you yourself will also be devoted to destruction. You are bringing destruction into your camp. And so on the last episode, we saw that the Israelites got defeated in their very next battle. They went into a town, which I don't know how to pronounce, so I'm just going to say A-I because it's spelled A-I, and I have no idea how you say two vowels together. And so they went into this city, and they got defeated. And Joshua was like, what in the world happened? We just defeated this humongous city, this fortified city of Jericho, and we didn't lose any men. And then this time we go into A-I, and we get run out of town, and we lose 36 guys, what happened, God? And God said, well, remember how I told you that if you take anything from Jericho, then you will be devoting your camp to destruction? Well, someone took something from the camp. And he said, in order to rid yourself of this, you need to find that person and the things that they took, and you need to destroy both of them. They need to be devoted to destruction so that you can rid yourself from these things and the destruction and the sin will no longer have any effect on you. And so that's what we talked about last time. Joshua did this. He found the man named Achan who had taken the beautiful cloak and the silver and the gold and they destroyed him and all of the things that he took. The penalty for this was death. And so now that that's how we start this lesson with Achan and all of the things that he had taken destroyed and them going into battle with AI again. And so this is Joshua 8 1. It says, The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and rise and go up to Ai. See, I've given into your hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. And so I want to stop right there and think about why is God telling them not to fear or be dismayed? Well, they got defeated last time, right? They'd gone into this city before and it didn't go well for them. But God is assuring them the reason that that happened is because you had brought sin into your camp and you've rid yourself of that sin now and you're starting with a clean slate. And so you don't have to be afraid this time. This time you will be victorious because you no longer have that sin looming over you. 
You no longer have to worry about death and destruction because you've rid yourself of that. Okay. And so I thought as we are starting this new year, this is actually a great way for us to begin by realizing whatever happened in the past, whatever sin we committed last year, whatever it is that we did yesterday doesn't matter. All that matters is what is before us. If we've recognized our sin and we have set that aside, we have buried it and put it away from us, then it's gone and we can start this new year with a clean slate and we can be victorious. Destruction and defeat and shame and guilt no longer have to be with us. This year, we can start encouraged, confident, and at peace. And so I just want to read you a couple of verses. The first one is 1 John 1, 9. And it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so trust God. Trust that if you have confessed your sins to him, that he has forgiven them and he has cleansed you from them. And now you have a new clean slate to start this year. Ezekiel 18, 30 to 32. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that your iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Turn away from your sin. Don't let it be your ruin. He says, I I take no pleasure in your destruction. And so he wants us to turn away from our sins. And when we turn away from our sins, then our sins are behind us. They no longer affect us. And now we can move forward because those things are gone. Last year is gone. The things that you did before, if you've confessed them, God has forgiven you of those things. He's cleansed you from them and they're gone. And now you can start again and move forward with a, in a new day. Listen to what it says in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That was Paul. And he says, I can move forward. I have a goal. And my goal is to do what God has asked me to do. And so that is what I'm going to be focused on. That is the goal that I am working towards. And everything that I did before, it's not perfect. And I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to mess with it. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And we can do that too. Second Corinthians 5, 15 to 17. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. And rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so, if you are in Christ, if you are walking with him, then all the old things are gone. And now you're a new creation and you can start this new year living for the man that died for you. That should be our goal. The goal that we press on towards this year. Move forward living for Jesus because he died for you. As a new creation, all those things in the past. This enables us to move forward confident and at peace instead of in fear and dismay. And that's what God was trying to tell Joshua. All that happened before, 
It's over. I'm not thinking about it anymore. I'm a gracious God. I've forgiven you. That's all dead and buried. And now you're going to move forward and you're going to be victorious. I'm with you. You don't have to be afraid. So what a wonderful way to start the new year. What a wonderful way for Joshua to go into this next battle, knowing that he has a clean slate. And then Joshua 8, 2 says, And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. Seriously? Now they can take the plunder. Now they don't have to refrain from getting the things in this city that they see. If Achan only would have waited. God only kept them from the things in the city the very first time. It was only once. But Achan doesn't know this. And so when I read this, I thought it's such a shame. If Achan would have only known. If Achan would have only known. So why would God not tell them that? Why would God not say, hey, when you go into these other battles, you're going to be able to have some of the things that are in this city, but not this one. So I just need you to have a little self-control one time. And if you will just do that this one time, dedicate everything to me and take nothing for yourselves just once, then after that, I'll let you have some things. Why didn't he do that? I feel, I don't know, but I feel like it would have been easier for Achan, at least. He still would have seen that beautiful cloak from Babylon, and he would have wanted it. And maybe he would have thought, well, I'm never going to find another coat like this, because this probably belonged to the king of Jericho, and the kings in some of these other places aren't nearly as important. So he might would have still taken it, but at least it would have given him a better shot, right? And so why? Why did God not tell them the whole story or at least the next step? You're not going to be deprived of these things forever, right? And then when I thought about you're not going to be deprived of these things forever, I thought, why does God deprive us of things? Why does God deprive his children of things? What was it going to hurt for him to take that coat? I'm sure that's what he was thinking. Why should this coat be burned? It would be much better off with me. Why is God telling me no? These things are hard for us. We want things. We have no patience. We have very little self-control. And we have a human brain that cannot understand the things of God. And so we doubt him sometimes. Sometimes we wonder, why would you deprive me? And the only answer that I have is that we aren't always going to know God's next step. We're not going to always know how things are going to turn out. We're not going to always know how long we're going to have to wait or if we will ever get the thing that we want. And we most likely will not know why it is that God is telling us no or why he is telling us to wait. But what we do know is that his motives are good that he loves us, he cares about us, and he is not just doing this because he can, because he has all the power to say no, so he does. He's not doing it because he doesn't want us to have good things, because he doesn't care about the things that we want. We know that that is true. We know that God's ways are good and right and true, and we can trust those things. Matthew 7, 11 says, if we as fathers know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more does our father in heaven know how to give good gifts to his children, right? And so God cares about us. In this case, he tells them these things are devoted to me. And so I think in this situation, the reason God told them no is because he wanted to see, are you going to make the smallest sacrifice for me? Are you going to withhold what you want to give me what I want? Are you willing to sacrifice for me? 
Look at all the things that I've done for you. Are you willing to do just this one thing for me? I think that's why he was doing it. And you know, if he would have told them, hey, you're only going to have to do this one time, then they would have maybe been doing it for the wrong reasons. Maybe they would have been not taking these things because they're like, oh, I'll get some next time so I can do this small sacrifice because they knew it was a small sacrifice. And maybe this time he doesn't want them to know how much of a sacrifice he's making. they're making. Maybe he wants them to wait to see if they will wait. Maybe he wants them to have self-control to see if they will have self-control, right? This is so hard for us. It does not come naturally to have self-control or patience. These are things that we have to actively do, right? It's not a passive thing. We can't just be patient. We have to work at it. We can't just control ourselves. We have to actually do something to make that happen, right? And that's the reason that a lot of times people will say, exercise a little patience or self-control. It's because it's work, something that we have to work at. And God knows this. And so maybe he's doing it because he wants us to sacrifice for him. Maybe he's doing it because he's trying to teach us a lesson. He's trying to teach us the greater things. We think that that coat or that money is very important. But God says, you know what's a bigger treasure? A bigger treasure is for you to trust me. A bigger treasure is for you to learn virtues that will bring you closer to me. Listen to what it says in Second Peter 1, 5 to 9. Giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to your virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and they abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and he's forgotten that he's been cleansed from his old sins. And so God wants to build upon our faith. And the way he does that sometimes is by making us exercise these values, these characteristics, these traits, making us exercise them. It says, add to your faith virtue. You believe, now be virtuous. And then once you're virtuous, get a little more knowledge. Learn about God. Read your Bible. Go to church. Hear more things about Him. And once you do that, and you know the things that he's telling you to do and not to do, then exercise a little self-control. And then when you have a little self-control, persevere in that and have more self-control and more self-control. And once you have persevered, you will be more like God. And then add to that brotherly kindness, just being kind to others. And then when you have learned to just be kind, then take that next step into loving them. If you can have these characteristics and they can abound in you, then you will never be barren. You will never be unfruitful in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. But if you don't have these things, then you've forgotten what God did for you. You're not growing in your faith. If we're not growing in our faith, then we're not really thinking about it. That's not what God wants from us. He wants a relationship with us and he wants us to grow in it. And so sometimes he deprives us of things or he makes us wait because he's trying to teach us patience or self-control. Sometimes he is wanting us to offer the sacrifice of obedience. Psalm 4, 5 says, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. And then maybe if we do this, if we do what God asks and we wait and we're patient, then maybe God will give us the thing the next time. We don't know. 
We have no idea how long we're going to wait, but we do know that God has our best interest at heart, and we know that he is taking care of us. His ways are good. His ways are right. And so we just have to trust him and wait. Galatians 6, 8, and 9 says, He who sows to his flesh will of his flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. And so God will reward his people. Sometimes the things that God withholds from us are just not good for us and we do not need them. Sometimes they're fine for us, but for some reason he's holding them back from us. Either he wants to teach us some sort of lesson or he's going to give them to us later, but it's not the right time. And so we just have to be patient and wait. And then eventually we'll get to the end of this thing and we'll see Oh, now he's lifted his restri- his hand and he says, you're no longer restricted from that. You can have that now. Now I'm going to give you this thing that you've desired all of this time. But then sometimes we get to the end of it and we still don't have the thing, but we realize we have him. We realize that through this, we have learned to trust him more. We realize that we're closer to him than we've ever been before. And even though we hate the situation we were in and we hope we never, ever have to live in that deprived state again, we do know that we acquired something while we were there. We got a gift, a treasure, better than the treasure that we wanted. And that was some virtue, some value that was spiritual, something that we couldn't get from this world. And then eventually, we know we have eternal life. We know that if we have accept Jesus as our Savior, then we will live forever with him. That is our greatest gift. And so don't grow weary in doing good. In due time, you will reap what you sow. So be patient. Know that God has your best interest at heart. And just do what he's asking you to do and don't worry about the outcome. God has that covered. He's taking care of you. So I wanted to address the fact that if he would have just waited, he would have gotten what he wanted and why God doesn't tell us these things sometimes. Because when we're in the midst of it, we're just like Achan. We want the thing and we don't know how how long we're going to have to wait for it. And so sometimes we just go ahead and fall to temptation. And I don't want us to do that. Now, on to the battle. This time, Joshua is taking things seriously. Last time he took 3,000 men into battle. This time he's taking 30,000. 10 times the amount that he had last time. He wants God to know, I'm taking it seriously this time. Now, the number of people that he takes into battle, the strategy that he has, That is not what wins him the battle. What wins and loses the battle every time is their obedience to God or their disobedience to God every single time. But by taking in a lot of men, Joshua is saying to the Lord, hey, I'm taking this serious. I understand that this is a big deal and I'm going to take in a lot of guys and I'm going to listen exactly to what you say and I'm going to do exactly what you say. And so God said, okay, I want you to take 5,000 men and I want you to put them on the west side of Ai. And these men are going to hide. No one is going to know they're there and I want them to sit. Then I want you to take 25,000 and I want you to put them on the north side. And so Joshua does this. Joshua takes 5,000 men, puts them between Bethel and Ai on the west. And 25,000 men, including him, go to the north and they say there's a ravine between them and Ai. The next day, the 25 men went into Ai as if they were going to attack them. When the king saw them, he went out to them and they turned away and ran out of the city as if they were afraid of them like they did last time. 
This was only to lure all the men away from the city so that the 5,000 could then go in and ambush the city after all of the men were gone. And so that's what they did. They went in, lured all the men out, ran away. All the men followed them. And then while they were out, the 5,000 men came in from the west and they attacked the city, captured it, plundered it, and then set it on fire. Once the city was on fire, the men of Ai realized that their city was on fire and now they're trapped. They're trapped between a burning city and 5,000 men and then these other 25,000 men. So Israel won that battle in that way that day. 12,000 people were killed and the only one that didn't kill in the field was the king. They took the king and it says they impaled him on a tree and they hung him there on that tree until the end of the day. This was to show everyone else in the land, hey, you worship other gods. These gods cannot protect you. And our God is the most powerful and we will defeat you. And then at the end of the day, they took the king down. They threw him at the city gate and they piled him with rocks. And this heap of rocks was there as a memorial of what had happened that day. After this, Joshua fulfills all of the words that were written in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. Moses told them, when you get to Mount Ebal, which was north of the city, and remember they were already north of the city of Ai. And so Moses said, when you get to Ebal, I want you to make an altar there and make it exactly like God told you to make it in Exodus 20, 25, where he said, don't shape it and decorate it and make it all about you. Just get uncut stones, make an altar, and then make sacrifices to God there on that altar on Mount Ebal. And so Joshua does this. Since they're already close to Mount Ebal after this battle, they go there, he builds an altar, he makes a burnt sacrifice and a peace offering there to the Lord. The burnt sacrifice is completely burned up as a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord given only to God, a total sacrifice from the people. The peace offering is eaten between the priests, which are eating on God's behalf, and the people. And this is a fellowship meal between God and his people, showing that there's peace between them. And so they give God these two offerings. And Joshua also puts the words of Moses on these stones of this altar, because that's also the instructions that he was given in in Deuteronomy 27. And then the rest of the instructions in these two chapters say, When you have crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim and bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And then these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curses, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And then the Levites will declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing by the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. And then he's going to say, Cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or mother. And the people will say, Amen. And then he'll say, Cursed be to anyone who moves his neighbor's landmark. And they'll say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road. Amen. Cursed be anyone who perverts justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And the people will say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his father's wife because he's uncovered the father's nakedness. And the people will say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with any kind of animal. And the people will say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his sister, whether the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. And the people will say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who lies with his mother-in-law. Amen. Cursed be anyone who strikes down his neighbor in secret. And the people will say, Amen. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood. And the people will say, Amen. 
And lastly, cursed be anyone who doesn't confirm the words of this law by doing them. And everyone will say, Amen. And so after they say all of those curses, then they say this. This is chapter 8 of Deuteronomy. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all the commandments that I've commanded you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth, and all of these blessings will come upon you and they'll overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord. And then it says, Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall the fruit of your womb be, and the fruit of the ground, and the fruit of the cattle, and the increase of your herds, and your young, and your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven. The Lord will command the blessings on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. The Lord will establish you as people holy to himself, as he has sworn to you, if you will keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they'll be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your livestock, the fruit of your ground, within the land that the Lord your God has sworn to the fathers to give you. And the Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens to give you the rain in your land in the seasons and to bless all of the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. And the Lord will make you head and not the tail. And you shall only go up and not go down if you obey the commands of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I've commanded you today to the right or the left, to go after the gods, to serve them. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God and be careful to do all the commandments and his statues that I command you today, then all of these curses will fall upon you and overtake you. And then he tells them that all of those blessings will turn to curses. And he lists them all. He says, instead of being blessed in the city, you'll be cursed in the city. Instead of your needing bowls being blessed, they will be cursed. Instead of you being protected from your enemies, you will not be protected from your enemies, and so on and so on. So you can read the rest of that. It's a very long passage in Deuteronomy uh, 28, and we've actually gone over it in previous lessons in detail. But this is what they did. And they did this as they went into the promised land so that they would know, now that you're in this place, if you will obey God and you will do all the things that he asks you to do, you will be blessed here. But if you do not, if you do any of these things that I ask you not to do, then you will be cursed here. They needed to know this right off so that they could start out right, just as we need to start our year off right. We need to think if we follow the Lord, then we will be blessed. Now, that doesn't mean that we have all of these specific blessings and curses that the people of Israel had at this exact time. This was specific to them. But it does mean that we will be blessed if we follow the Lord. Our lives will be at peace. We will always have him. Even if everything around us is going badly, we may not always have wonderful blessings on this earth, but we will always have the Lord our God if we are following him. And if we don't follow him, then we do have the consequences of those actions here on this earth. And they're not good. Following our own way, doing our own thing, we are not living a blessed life. These difficulties will be brought on by our own actions. Not because we live in a sinful world. Not because naturally things, bad things happen. But because we are bringing those bad things on ourselves because we're not following God. Because we all know there are natural consequences to our actions. And so we want to start this year taking God's word seriously. Do what they did in this passage. 
Put all of your past sins behind you and move forward living for God with a new slate, trusting him and patiently obeying him, doing what he says, even if you don't want to, even if you don't understand, wait and trust that he has your best interest at heart. Follow him totally and completely just as Joshua did. Do you notice how completely Joshua followed? He did this battle exactly like God told him. He made the altar at the exact place God told him. He put the words on the altar exactly like God told him. He built the altar exactly like God told him. He praised him. He thanked him. And then he pronounced these blessings and curses exactly as God told him to do. Take God's word seriously. It's important. Listen to what he says and follow it. He gives us these rules for our good. Proverbs 16.20 says, He who heeds the word wisely will find good. And what whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. And then Proverbs 25, 28 says, He who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. We're vulnerable if we don't have any rule over our own spirit. Without self-control, we are vulnerable to all the temptations. When we aren't able to discipline ourselves and guard ourselves, then we're vulnerable to all the things. So don't be like a man without walls. Patience and self-control are a continuous exercise, but they do yield rewards. We just have to persevere. I'm going to end with these two verses. Psalm 19, 7 through 11 says, The law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. They rejoice the heart. His commandments are pure. They enlighten the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. In keeping God's laws, in patiently obeying, in having self-control is great reward because his words warn us. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Endure temptation, resist, and you will receive the crown of life. We have God, and we can start this new year fresh and new, the new slate, without fear, without dismay, without guilt or shame, confident at peace, striving towards the goal of pleasing our Lord and Savior, living for the one who died for us. Let's commit to that goal this year. That's all I have today. Make sure that you go to livethroughjesus.com and read the blog post that I have for this lesson. It talks more about the fruits of the Spirit and the works of the flesh and how God tries to grow those things in us. And I think that you'll be inspired by that. And then also follow me on all of my social media. I will be posting some of these scriptures there. And so you'll have those things. Share this podcast or YouTube episode with all of those that you know. Leave me a five-star review. And then lastly, if you would like the written lesson, it has more scriptures in there than I have time to read in the podcast. And you can go through them at your own pace. You can also print them out. You can go through them with your Bible study group or whoever you would like to study with. 
You can study by yourself and just get more in depth. And so if you would like to do that, go to livethroughjesus.substack.com. You will get one lesson every week. This lesson that I do for free on podcast, it does cost $6 a month, but you get more there in writing. And like I say, you can print this out and you can study it with your friends or however you want to do that. So I always appreciate your support in that way if you are able to do that. And it's something that you feel like you would benefit from. So I hope that this has been encouraging to you and I'll see you back next week. Thanks and have a good day. Thank you.